put us into place folk songs, myth, and situated knowledge in Mysore, India, that explores the folk songs on the mythology of Mysore's Chamundeshwari and her consort Nanjundeshwara. In his talk titled, She Killed the Buffalo Demon and Dwells on the Middle of the Hill, Myth, Locality, and Cosmological Significance in Better the Chamundi, a Kannada folk song, he will focus on the first two narrative songs from the Kannada folk ballad, Better the Chamundi. These songs feature the epic cosmic battle between the goddess and the buffalo demon, situating these events of cosmic importance within Mysore's religious landscape. While these songs reflect themes found in more well-known pan-Indian myths, they are uniquely formed within the context of Southern Karnataka. The talk will highlight how the deities and their deeds are fully localized within their surrounding environment, producing a unique local myth that reflects regional religious practice and gives us a glimpse into how local religious history is understood by the common folk. So on that note, we welcome our speaker for the day. And uh, it is an evening here for all of us. And I think it is break of dawn there for Dr. Simons. And without much further ado, I hand this over to Dr. Simons to take it from here. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very happy to be here. It's actually a little before the the break of dawn. <laughs> it's still quite dark out. It's about 4:30 uh, in the in the morning. So thank you for having me. I'm I'm going to try to share uh, PowerPoint. I've I've never done this on Google Meet, so um, please bear with me if it doesn't quite work. Okay. Um, can you see? Can you see the PowerPoint on the screen at all? Uh, I think it's yet to come on the screen. Okay, so it's it's under another account. I mean, it's it's up, not absolutely necessary. It's just uh, images. So maybe, um, yeah, maybe it's not necessary, and we'll just not worry about that. So let me just end that to actually speed up my um, internet. Okay. All right, so again, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very happy to be part of um, this series and I look forward to, to our discussion afterwards. Um, I've, I've been working on this book for a while. Uh, I started it in about 2011. Uh, in the meantime, came out with my, my other book, Devotional Sovereignty, that was published this year by Oxford. This one is still very much a, a work in progress and it's about the some folk songs uh, in uh, Southern Karnataka, especially sung in Mysore, Utnali, and Nanjungudu. Uh, and so as part of this, this is a, a written project, I'll just be reading uh, a modified version of a portion of uh, what will become chapter two eventually. So I look forward to, to our discussion. So um, uh, as was said, the, the title of this is She Killed the Buffalo Demon and Dwells on the Middle of the Hill, a Myth Locality and Cosmological Significance uh, in the Kannada Folk Ballad, uh, Betara Chamundi. So this lecture focuses on the first two narrative songs, Sister, Stand on My Tongue and Fight, and She Bathes in the Company and Kaveri. Despite the overall ballad's primary focus on the romantic relationship between the goddess Chamundi and her consort Nanjunda, the two songs that we'll focus on in this talk feature the epic battle between the goddess and the buffalo demon that situates these events of cosmic importance within Mysore's religious landscape. While these songs reflect themes found in more well-known pan-Indian myths, they are uniquely formed within the context of Southern Karnataka. Thus, the nascence of Chamundi of the Hill, or Betara Chamundi, uh, the story serves as an oral local sacred history, or Stalaparana of Mysore, that speaks to the cosmological importance of the city and the region, and explains them as the epicenter of divine power, or Shakti, and action. I will highlight how the deities and their deeds are fully localized within the surrounding environment, producing a unique local myth that reflects regional religious practice and gives us a glimpse into how local religious history is understood by the common folk. In order to demonstrate how the buffalo slaying myth of Chamundi of the Hill reflects the concerns and identities of the folk, these two songs and the ritual world in which they exist are compared to broader pan-Indian Sanskritic myths and the elite ritual practice of the Mysore kings. While certain aspects of the songs 
sisters stand on my tongue and fight, and she bathes in the company and Kaveri, are recognizable to those familiar with Hindu myth more broadly. The narrative contained within these songs provide a unique local myth, and the details of which deserve our full attention and consideration beyond a mere comparison to the pan-Indian myth with which they share some details. Therefore, before moving into an analysis of the songs, it is necessary that the reader be familiar with the details of the mythological context of Mysore and the specifics of the local myth. In the following section, I briefly summarize the mythological narrative of these two songs before we move into a broader discussion. So this title of this section is Establishing the Goddess of Mysore, the Demon Slayer Folk Myth in Chamundi of the Hill. Sister Stand on My Tongue and Fight begins with fairly common hymns of praise to the goddess Chamundi. While at first the praise is relatively generic, the listener is quickly informed that this Chamundi is famous for having defeated and slain Mahisha, the infamous buffalo demon of Indian mythology. Through this simple acclamation, the episode immediately transitions from honorifics to the specific local history, situating a mythological milieu that has lasted for millennia in South Asia within the local goddess tradition of Mysore and its surrounding areas. While the explicit connection of the local network of deities and their attendant practices with the myth of the buffalo demon are certainly a novel aspect of the narrative, the connection between the city of Mysore as a city and a region has been associated with the great buffalo demon for quite some time. Mysore, as most of you know, is an anglicized name for the city of region or region from the colonial period that was derived from the original Kannada name Mysuru. The common and popular etymology of Mysuru is that it too is a derivation, but from the Sanskrit term Mahisha or buffalo that was combined with the Kannada term for the city or native place, Uru. So Mahisha plus Uru became Mahishuru or the native place of the buffalo. According to this etymology, over time, Mahishuru was truncated to Mysuru in the local language. The connection between the buffalo and the naming of the broader region dates back to at least the 5th century CE, and by the 10th century, buffalo in some form of another was frequently included for na in, within names of the region. By 1128, however, the city that is now Mysore, or more accurately, Chamundi Hill outside of Mysore, was explicitly associated with the buffalo in an inscription from the reign of the Hoysala king Vishnu Vardhana. This inscription records a donation that was made in the quote-unquote buffalo country uh, on top of Chamundi Hill, but actually calls the hill by its older name Mahabalachala, or the Hill of Shiva, not Chamundi Hill. This might indicate that the narrative of the buffalo demon and the goddess had yet to be associated with the hill, or the local goddess who resides at its precipice. After the 12th century, records to the Buffalo country in reference to the city of Mysore remained sparse and did not resume with any consistency until a few decades after the woodier kings of Mysore emerged on the political scene in 1610 CE. Specifically, the association was made in 1639 when a royal inscription from Kantirava Narasaraja Woodier associated the goddess of the hill with the slaying of the buffalo demon. Uh, specifically referring to her as Mahishasara Mardani. Since the rule of Kintirava Narasaraja, however, the myth of the local goddess and the buffalo demon has been ingrained into the local psyche. As alluded to, but not fully explored in these songs, the popular etymology of Mysore as the native place of the buffalo is reflected in folk and elite mythological history of the city. Throughout the region, it is popularly believed that the buffalo demon formerly was formerly the ruler of the region and that Mysore city was his capital. Even today, as pilgrims, re pilgrims reach the top of Chamundi Hill, they are greeted by a larger-than-life sculpture of the demon in his anthropomorphic form. So the image that you would be seeing now is the image of the statue of Mahishasara uh, on the top of Chamundi Hill, if you're familiar with it. Additionally, the battle between the goddess and the buffalo demon that is included in the lyrics of the first song, Sisters Stand on My Tongue and Fight, is literally stamped on the landscape of Chamundi Hill and within local collective memory at what is called Buffalo Point or uh, Konanamule. This site is located in the protected forest lands of Chamundi Hill, 
not, not far from the colossal image of Shiva's bull vehicle Nundi that was installed near midway of the footpath of the hill. Uh, to someone unfamiliar with the site, at first it seems rather unremarkable, with its geological formations uh, simply looking like rocks, but it does provide a decent vista of Mysore City. But whenever you're in the presence of learned guides, uh, the site comes alive with the movements of the ep epic mythological battle. The cracks and divots in the face of the hill's rock are imprinted memories of the footsteps of the goddess, the paws of her lion vehicle, the hooves of the buffalo demon, and the blows directed at Chamundi and absorbed by Mahisha. The workers from the temple can use these features to recreate the entire battle, even down to the massive crack where the hill was split by the force of the goddess's trident. Interestingly, the name of the site, Buffalo Point, suggests local origins in the myth, since the Kannada term Kona is used in reference to the buffalo demon instead of the Sanskrit Mahisha. So again, unfortunately, you can't see the image, but uh, in the image I, I have, there's a few temple workers actually recreating this uh, epic battle um, using the divots and the cracks of the rocks to, to tell the story. Well, the context of Chamundi Hill is certainly framed against the backdrop of the goddess slaying the buffalo demon. The focus of the, the narrative is on another epic battle waged by the goddess against Mahisha's younger brother, Aisu, or Aisasura, or the mini demon. Uh, the mini is in multiple demon. Uh, after Chamundi has killed Mahisha, Aisasura emerges and grabs the forearm of the goddess. The action of grabbing the forearm is symbolically loaded as it suggests the demon is attempting to take Chamundi as his wife, against her will, what Dharma Shastras call a rakshasa or demonic marriage. The goddess, however, withstands this forceful proposal, and with another of her forearms, she grabs the hilt of her sword and with another the nape of the demon's neck, as she thrusts her sword into the demon. Instead of dying, every drop of blood that gushed out of Isasura another demon was born, producing innumerable demonic armies in the process. And as his blood produces more and more demons, the clever Isasura hides in the belly of his deceased brother, the buffalo demon Mahisha, knowing that the goddess would not be able to overcome the demons that he has miraculously produced. Chamundi, despite her best efforts, cannot overcome the exponentially increasing number of her foes. This left the goddess both exhausted and bewildered. As she looks around for someone to ask for help, she wipes the sweat that was pouring all over her body and flings it to the ground. In this moment, as her frustration reached its limits, the narrative breaks from the action and leaves Mysore, only to relocate the scene in the divine ranch or Gokula of the god Krishna. Krishna at once realizes that Chamundi was fighting a losing battle. So Krishna leaves his divine abode and travels to Mysore to give Chamundi aid. Immediately, the narrative focuses back on the goddess as she slings rivers of sweat onto the ground. In an action that mirrors the blood reproduction of Aisu, another goddess named Utnali, or the goddess of the middle, Midway Village, emerges from Chamundi's sweat, spreading her seven hoods and her seven tongues. Upon seeing Utnali, Chamundi is confused because she doesn't know who this new goddess is or where she is from. But after hearing that Utnali had been born from her own sweat, Chamundi becomes overjoyed and welcomes the goddess as her younger sister. Then Chamundi quickly relates the impossible situation to her new sister, explaining that she had successfully killed the great buffalo demon, but was unable to thwart his younger brother because of his magical reproductive blood. Luckily, Utnali does not share her, sa her elder sister's pessimism. Udnali instead quickly spreads her seven tongues, covering the entire hill, and says, Chamundi, sister, stand on my tongue and fight, from which the title of the song comes. Quickly, Chamundi is able to defeat all the replica Isasuras, but there is no sign of their source, the original Isasura. So she stands on the corpse of Mahisha and looks around the hill for the demon's brother. When they couldn't find Isasura, Udnali realizes that he must be hiding the buffalo, and Chamundi thrusts her trident into the corpse, splitting it in half. From the carcass, the real Isasura emerges, far more formidable and monstrous than his elder brother. At the sight of this hideous demon, 
Chamundi once again becomes overwhelmed. As tears come to her eyes, she meditates on Shiva, and immediately the deity Brahma comes, becomes aware of her situation and his role in it. For it was Brahma who had given Isasra his power of hemo reproduction or blood reproduction. To undo the evil effects of his previous deed, Brahma sent the goddess a lion to serve as her vehicle and companion. With the aid of her lion, she quickly defeated Isasra, and the song ends with the goddess victorious seated on her lion, her standard contemporary iconography at the Chamundeshwari temple. The narrative of Chamundi and Isasra is reminiscent of others found in Hindu goddess mythology, particularly the myth of the goddess and the demon you can call Bloodseed or Raktabija. Indeed, this myth from Mysore seems to reflect some of the same commentary on gender norms and reproduction that has been observed by scholars of the Sanskrit narrative. Through the tale of the battle, there is a clear symmetry between the virility of Isasura and Chamundi, and even an inversion of the sexual roles of, the, of genders in the reproductive process. In the narrative, Isasura and Chamundi undergo similar reproductive processes, but ultimately Chamundi proves to be more virile. Indeed, in every aspect of the process, the goddess is more auspicious and more powerful. The source of her power is Krishna, uh, Isasura's is Brahma. Chamundi produces the powerful Utnali. Isasura produces less powerful replicas of himself. The reproductives, while both polluting, sweat is far higher on the purity scale than blood. The narrative's focus on reproduction also firmly entrenches the situatedness or local nature of the story. The battle is not a war for cosmic domination or to restore the cosmic realms to the Vedic deities. The battle is a battle for Mysore, a battle to be master of this specific place on Earth. Uh, there have long been rituals that linked the virility or virya of a, of a ruler with the fecundity uh, of the earth o um, over which the king rules. As far back as the Vedas, rituals have connected the male king's virility to the fertility of the ground as a basis for the king's sovereignty and right to rule. However, in this narrative, after the death of the king, that it's Mahishasara, at the hands of the goddess Chamundi, she challenges the virility of the rightful successor, the younger brother, Isasara. Through the birth of Utnali, the product of the mixing of Chamundi's reproductive fluid, which is her sweat, and the earth, she produced greater offspring, thereby demonstrating her power as the proper ruler of Mysore's domain. This was further realized when she was able to use her superior virility to best the demon in combat. The myth is further linked to the locality of Mysore through the local geological knowledge of the hill itself. While the hill is called Chamundi Hill, the folk history of the geological formation is that it is formed from the carcass of the massive buffalo demon itself. So again, if you could see the PowerPoint here, it would be a, a slide of uh, Chamundi Hill from uh, very far back, a, a large landscape image. Uh, the massive uh, carcass uh, is also critical to the song's ongoing inversion of the gendered reproduction assumption. Uh, and also in that same image, I overlay an image of a, of a buffalo. So you can sort of see that the hill itself looks a lot like a, a buffalo that's either sleeping or, or dead. So after the death of Mahishasara, the demon Isasara hides in the belly of the demon. The belly of Mahishasara, in this case, also acts as a metaphorical wound from which Isasura is born after Chamundi thrust her trident into the buffalo demon. Mahisha's corpse then produces the true form of Isasura, who looks like a huge hillock. I don't wish to push the metaphorical reading too far, but it is important to note that the inversion of Chamundi's normative gender expectation here, as the song emphasizes her virility in what could be read as quote-unquote masculine reproductive tropes, uh, that is, her reproductive fluid impregnates the earth, all these things I've already talked about. This theme, however, is overshadowed uh, with the third song, and as we move forward throughout the entire ballad, which we'll not discuss today, uh, which all of which are actually aimed at downplaying her virility and her ferocity and actually makes her into a more domesticated version of the goddess as she embarks on this romantic relationship with Nanjundeshwara. So if the local emphasis was not clear at this point, the second song of the ballad, she bathes in the company in Kaveri, 
uh, makes explicit Chamundi's and Utnali's roles with the local religious networks. This is most clearly and explicitly related after the great battle of the two goddesses discuss, as they discuss the division of divine responsibilities and devotion that ties them to the city of Mysore. After Asasura's death is confirmed, Utnali, who is concerned with her sister's prolonged happiness, opines that she is not always around to help. Additionally, the younger goddess realizes that since she was only just manifested from her sister, that she is actually homeless, with no place to go and no place to call her own. Chamundi, however, gives Utnali the lay of the land, explaining that she is the queen of Mysore. The elder sister tells her younger sister that in her role as divine protector of the city, she must reside on top of the hill. Chamundi also explains that she's the house deity, or Mane Devaru, of Ch Chamaraja, the woodier king. And as part of their relationship, every year she must take part in her annual worship or puja. While a theme of royal patronage is repeated throughout the ballad, the relationship between the woodier king and Chamundi is taken for granted in its verses, reflecting assumptions from the local histories about the goddess and her role in royal devotion of the woodiers. So this next section is uh, royal and local goddesses in which we'll discuss the royal patronage of Chamundi and uh, local festivals that uh, work alongside it or run parallel. The history of Mysore is a site of royal importance. Uh, like a mythological importance described above, it's well ingrained within the popular imagination. Most modern popular courtly and academic histories uh, narrate and recount the same story concerning the rise of the woodier kings at the end of the 14th century. Two brothers, Yadaraya and Krishnaraya, migrated from the city of Dwaraka in modern-day Gujarat in northwest India, per the instructions from the deity Krishna that they had received in a dream. Before coming to Mysore, the brothers passed through the popular mountainous pilgrimage site of Vindhyavasani, or she who dwells in the Vindhya Mountains, who directs them to Mysore, where, they, where she promises that they could claim a kingdom that had previously been promised by Krishna. It is said that once they arrive in Mysore, Chamundi came to the brothers. Chamundi came to the brothers, giving them instructions whereby they could defeat the tyrant who ruled the region and become kings themselves. It is as part of this alliance that the goddess and the brother and this alliance with the goddess that the brothers then accepted Chamundi as their house deity accepting the privileges of kingship along with the responsibilities of providing proper ritual sustenance to the goddess. While the ritual to Chamundi alludes to in the, is alluded to in the folk songs is not explicitly named, the details she provides us gives us clues through which we can decipher the festival that requires her participation as part of her responsibilities to Mysore and its woodier kings. Throughout the ritual calendar, there are several important events for Chamundi. The first of these is Chamundi's birthday festival, which takes place on the seventh day of the dark night of the summer month of Ashada, typically June or July, according to the Kannada calendar. While this is a day of revelry with royal participation, the Woodier family provides the silver palanquin uh, and carries the festival image on procession. The festivities are isolated to the top of the hill. Likewise, Chamundi's great festival, or Mahotsava, which takes place at the end of the autumnal month of Ashwin is replete with royal participation. The chariot festival is inaugurated by the Mysore Maharaja with a puja ritual and a ceremonial pulling of the large wooden chariot or ratta. Uh, and the royal family's attendance at all major events like the, the Tipotsava or boat festival are expected. However, this festival is also conducted entirely on the top of the goddess's sacred hill. Between these two festivals, however, is the great Mysore celebration of Dasara. That is the culmination of the festival of Navratri, or the Nine Nights of the Goddess. This celebrates the goddess, her many forms and many feats, including her victory over the, buff over the buffalo demon. Nowadays, Dasara is a large pageant of Kanadiga, uh, an Indian cultural pride, but the festival is rooted in a long history of goddess devotion. In contemporary practice of the festival in Mysore that takes place outside the public eye and inside the religious space, we can still see the aspects of the ritual <clears throat> to which the, the bard's songs refer. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
at the beginning of Navratri in Mysore, the festival image of uh, Chamundi that is kept in the Mysore Palace is sent to the Chamundeshwari Temple on top of Chamundi Hill and is installed in one of the side shrines of the temple to receive daily puja throughout the 10-day festival. By receiving puja in her primary temple, the festival image, or Utsala Vigraha, throughout, uh, is imbued with divine power or shakti from the goddess's Mulamurti, or primary image, in the temple's main chancel. On the final day of the celebration, or the tenth day, that is Dasra or Vijaya Dashami, the image is taken in a small procession from the hill temple to the palace, where a special puja is performed by the king and the goddess's priests. Traditionally, this would be the moment when the power of the goddess is transferred to the king, after which the king would leave the palace on a procession that commenced the annual military expeditions. In contemporary India, however, since the nation is a secular republic and the Maharaja is without military power, the image of the goddess has replaced the king on procession and the image is newly invigorated by the goddess is taken on procession throughout the city. In the song, She Bathes in the Company in Kaveri, the bards, through the words of the goddess, confirm the royal importance of this ritual, alluding to its significance as the reason uh, that she must continue to reside on the hill, demonstrating that the broader population recognized the importance of the courtly ritual of the transference of power within the broader historical apparatus of the festival. While Chalmundi is de depicted as a royal goddess, the text is equally transparent in the role of her sister Utnali. If Chalmundi is to remain there for the kings, Utnali must remain there for her sister and for, her, for the people. Instead of remaining on top of the hill, Utnali is told to go to the base of the hill to her eponymous village, Utnali. That's the in-between or the midway village. Um, it's geographically located between Chamundi Hill and um, Nanjungudu. There, Chamundi promises that the goddess Utnali will regularly receive puja, homemade offerings, and tambitu, the sweet uh, made from uh, flour, rice, and jaggery. To the careful reader, distinct formulations concerning the ritual and devotional apparatus of the two goddesses are clear. Chamundi's ritual imbues power to the royal family, but Utnali is a goddess for everyone and particularly partial to homemade things and inexpensive treats. These details, along with her epithet as Mariama, are reflective of Utnali's role as a South Indian village goddess or Grama Devate. Grama Devates are common phenomena in South India and are situated within and on the outskirts of villages, towns, and cities, and rule the metaphysical and physical space under their purview. They are responsible for warding off evil beings, providing good health for villagers, and invigorating their territory and the human ruler through their powerful energy. These deities, however, can also be temperamental and require the village to pay their respects through sacrifice or their benevolent protection and blessing can turn into destruction and malevolence. The practical and devotional lives of these goddess traditions focus on the goddess's relationship to specific situated places, despite any and all transformation from external influences. And the cults of these local village deities continue non-Brahminic rituals and practices that developed outside the Mahadevi or great goddess Shakta tradition or the Shaiva traditions with which they're associated. Though the village goddess uh, Utnali is seemingly homogenized with the pan indi uh, goddesses like Kali through her mythology, she simultaneously resists homogeneity through the persistence of local practice and ritual and her connection with the small eponymous village of Utnali. Despite the similarities between her origin myth in Sister Stand on My Tongue and Fight and the pan-Indian myth of Kali and Raktabija, as more details about Utnali unfold throughout the course of the ballad, both she and her sister Chamundi maintain their distance from elite ritual culture, reflecting on the non brahminic nature of their many rituals. It also seems likely that Chamundi of Mysore was once also a local Grama Devate, whose identity was shaped over time and became associated with the pan-Indian goddess of Durga, the slayer of the buffalo demon Mahisha, who played a prominent role in the Devi Mahatmyam and the Devi Bhagavata Purana. Sri Padma has argued that this process is quite common in the development of village goddesses in modernity, and particularly, quote, 
The famous Hindu deities Durga and Kali have grown to encompass many Gramadevata cults, end quote. Certain clues to the Gramadevata uh, identity of the goddess of Chamundi Hill can still be seen in the recent history of the Chamundeshwari temple and in many of the non-Brahmin rituals performed outside the temple walls. <coughs> Excuse me. Traditionally, the priests of the Chamundeshwari temple on the Chamundi Hill were Shivarchikas, uh, also known as Tomadi, a non-Brahminical agricultural caste found in the Mysore district. The Shivarchika priests were removed from their position at the Chamundi temple between 1819 and 1848 and were replaced by several Brahmins, Brahmin Sampradayas, including Dikshita head priests imported from Tamil Nadu by the Woodier rulers. It was at this point that the non-Sanskritic or non-Agamic um, rites at the temple, including the ritual sacrifice of animals, began to dwindle. While we can only speculate about the origins of Chamundi of Mysore from the fragmentary and dehistoricized evidence found in contemporary ritual spaces, the details of the songs provide similar evidence regarding the shared village deity identity of Chamundi and Utnali. Part of the theme of the overall ballad is the discussion of ritual offerings of flesh related to both Utnali and Chamundi. Though Chamundi never speaks directly about blood rites in this song or any other song, uh, they are brought to the forefront repeatedly by Utnali. There is a tension within Chamundi's identity as a fierce, independent goddess and one who wishes to marry a Brahmin. Indeed, the song repeatedly portrays the sister goddesses as low caste because they eat meat. In several song, other songs in the overall ballad, they are, there are extended conversations in which Chamundi is reminded about her station with specific references to the food that she eats. Um, and that means sort of what ritual offering she accepts. When discussing Chamundi, uh, Chamundi's love marriage with Nanjan, Nanjanda Swami or Nanjandeshwara, Utnali reminds her sister that Shiva is a Brahman and wears a linga and ochre robes, all sign that he's a um, Lingayat uh, Brahman uh, identity. Uh, but in contrast to him, they eat both chickens and goats. At one point, Shiva's two elder wives even insult Chamundi by saying that she enjoys eating cats. While Utnali remains her meat eating, uh, retains her meat-eating identity, the songs resolve the tension for Chamundi by repeatedly but obliquely suggesting that she accepts meats only because of her relationship with the kings, making an exception for blood sacrifice as part of the royal ritual program. At one point, Shiva's, one of Shiva's, Shiva's elder wives makes this quite explicit when she says, Chamundi eats buffaloes and sheep like they do in the palace. This ballad obscures the local tradition of Chamundi by blending local ritual practice and flesh offering with her capacity as the royal goddess. So the next section is titled Rejecting Pan-Indianization, Sanskritization, Brahmanization, and Sanitization. The narratives of Chamundi and Utnali found in the first two songs of Betara Chamundi, or Chamundi of the Hill, has several similarities to materials found in broader Indian mythological contexts particularly the well-known Puranic battles between the goddess and the demon, namely Mahishasara and Raktabija. I have intentionally only gestured to the Sanskritic iterations of this narrative up to now, because it is important that we don't simply consider local or folk narratives as derivatives of these pan-Indic stories, but as meaningful creations of their own merit. Therefore, I hesitate to compare the local Kannada songs with these more well-known myths, lest I unintentionally reinforce the too simplistic theory that local myth is only a derivative of the broader mythic corpus. I proceed, however, because through the process of comparison, the complexities that exist within the songs of Southern Karnataka can demonstrate how they function as important contributions to regional memory and history. The complicated relationship between the local and the Sanskritic pan-Indic traditions begins with the name Chamundi itself. Though the name Chamundi or Chamunda is commonly found in Sanskrit sources like the Puranas, uh, but many scholars believe that the name was, has a complicated history that demonstrates the fluidity of traditions in India and how theories like Sanskritization and Brahmanization can often be misleading and unhelpful because they attempt to meta-theorize all local goddess traditions. The first major inclusion of Chamunda within the Sanskritic mythological 
tradition is found in the third episode of the Puranic Devi Mahatmyam. Like the text previous episode, the gods have been overtaken by demons, in this case Shumba and Nishumba, who had stolen portion of the Vedic sacrifice. The gods, however, remembered the promise which had been made to them by the goddess at the end of the Mahisha episode of the Devi Mahatmyam and called to the goddess for help. Two of Shumba and Nishumba's spies, Chanda and Munda, saw the beautiful goddess and returned to tell their kings about this great jewel. After several attempts to seize the goddess, during which she defeated several of Shumba and Nishumba's lesser generals, the demon lord Shumba ordered Chanda and Munda to go and violently bring her by her hair. Uh, it's certainly a call out to the Mahabharata narrative. Chanda and Munda attacked the goddess on the high mountains with four legions of asuras. The goddess saw the all oncoming armies and let out a cry that caused her face to become black as ink. Then from her, uh, Kali emerged with a sword, a noose, a skull staff, and a necklace made of severed heads and a tiger skin skirt. With her mouth wide, tongue lolling, and deep red eyes, Kali let out a mighty roar and devoured all the demon armies. Chanda and Munda then uh, began to assail her with an onslaught of arrows and chakras, or discus, that vanished into Kali's mouth like the sun enveloped by a black cloud. Amused by the futility of her enemy's tactics, the hag goddess Kali cackled, cackled, bore her teeth uh, for all to see, and then mounted the lion. She then grabbed Chanda by the hair and decapitated him. Munda, seeing Chanda dead, ran at her, but was immediately felled by her sword. Carrying the heads of Chanda and Munda, Kali approached the goddess, uh, called Chandika here, uh, and uh, playfully said, For me, these great sacrificial um, animals, Chanda and Munda, your portion of the battle sacrifice. I will now, uh, you will now kill Shumba and Nishumba. To which the goddess replied, because you have taken hold of Chanda and Munda and brought them to me, you will be called Chamunda. In the remainder of the episode, Kali is called Chamunda several more times, but only in the context of the goddess's battle with the demon Rastabija, which we've already talked about briefly. In this battle, uh, share similar uh, similarities to the stories of Utnali and Isasura. Kali slash Chamunda was forced to drink the blood of the demon who was overwhelming the band of mothers or the uh, Matragana. Uh, within the Deva Mahatmya story, the goddess along with the Matragana were overwhelmed in their fight with Raktabija since every time the goddess struck him with an arrow, spear, or with their swords, each droplet of blood spawned another Raktabija. The more they fought, the greater the impulse it becomes. Realizing the futility of their methods and the humor of the god's fear, the goddess commanded Kali, who is explicitly called Chamunda at this point in the text, to open her mouth and drink the blood of the demon as it fell from her sword, and then to eat all the demons that had previously been produced by Raktabija's reproduction. Proceeding with this new strategy, the goddess promptly defeated their demon foe. While not explicit in the verses of the text, Many illustrated manuscripts of the Devi Mahatmyam, uh, similar to the narrative of Vaitara Chamundi, have envisioned uh, Chamunda extending her tongue across the battlefield to protect it from Raktavija's gushing blood, as depicted in the 18th century Nepalese manuscript from the Los Angeles County Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I would be showing this image now, but uh, I can't, couldn't get my presentation to work. All right, so like the episode in which Chanda and Munda were defeated, uh, Chamunda's role was immediately efficacious because of their her fierce nature and bloodlust. Chamunda and Kali are grouped together because of their similar thirst for violence and their non-normative appearance and actions. In fact, historically, the iconography of Kali and Chamunda, emaciated hag goddess, seated or standing on a corpse, was virtually identical during the medieval period, save Chamunda's fondness for her owl companion and Kali's predilection for copulation. Uh, they are the fiercest of all the goddesses. Chamunda, though, seems to be the fiercer of the two. Uh, the authors or editors incorporated into any narrative. <clears throat> the Deva Mahatmyam also contains the story of the goddess and the buffalo demon, one of the most well-known stories in India that is central in the pan-Indian festival of Navratri or Vijaya Dashami, or Dasara, as it's known in Mysore. The goddess and the buffalo demon myth appears to predate its literary tradition and can be seen in numerous images, especially for Matra, where a female figure snaps the neck of a teriomorphic buffalo. 
The Deva Mahatmyam, however, provides the first literary narrative of the goddess instead of Skanda killing the buffalo demon. Thereafter, the slaying of the buffalo demon becomes a common story within goddess-oriented texts or in goddess-oriented portions of larger Puranic works. In subsequent tellings of the myth, however, additional narrative details were added, including the story of the goddess granting Mahisha liberation or moksha through a sacrifice. An example of this is the Kalika Purana. In the Dev Mahatmyam's telling of the story, the goddess, here called Ambika, materializes from the collective energy, or tejas, of the male deities to combat the demon king, who has stolen their portion of the Vedic sacrificial offering, destabilizing cosmic administration. Upon seeing this divine figure manifested, the goddesses rejoiced and offered her their primary war implements. After being properly outfitted for the battle, she, along with her armies and lion mouth, went to battle Mahisha and his army of demons. The goddess and her army, army easily won the first round of battles and killed numerous hordes of demons. However, when Mahisha, Mahishasura joined the battle, it quickly turned the tide against the goddess's army. But when the demon king turned his sights on her lion, this infuriated the goddess, and she became resolute in his destruction and caught the buffalo in a snare. Mahisha promptly freed himself by changing form in, into the form of a lion. As soon as he had shapeshifted, Ambika beheaded the demon, but from the neck hole Mahisha emerged as a man. The goddess then hit the demon with a flurry of er arrows, but he resisted the onslaught by taking the form of an elephant. After she was able to break off his trunk, Mahisha once again resumed his buffalo form and roared at the goddess. Amused by his performance, the goddess downed an intoxicating beverage, let out a loud laugh, and said, Roar now, you fool, while I drink this wine, but after I kill you, only the gods will roar. Then the goddess leapt up, the de leapt upon the demon, uh, kicking and striking him with her spear. Trying to escape from the blows dealt by the goddess, Mahisha began to morph into another form. However, as he emerged from the head of the buffalo, the goddess decapitated the asura, or demon, killing him on the spot. The gods were so overwhelmed by the power and majesty of the goddess they praised her as the creator, the Vedas incarnate, the Vedic sacrifice, and the root of all existence, or Prakriti, amongst many other adulations. Moved by their exaltations, the goddess offered a, the gods a boon, and sensing her old unlimited power, the gods asked her to come to the aid of her devotees whenever they called upon her. It was this boon that was remembered by Shumba and Nishumba in the Shumba and Nishumba episode, and was perhaps invoked by millennia of goddess worshippers since the origin of this tale. Scholars like Thomas Coburn have argued that the narratives contained within the Devi Mahatmya were the first attempts to subdue this gruesome, bloodthirsty, independent, overwhelming, powerful goddesses within the Bra Brahminic pantheon under the umbrella of the great goddess or Mahadevi tradition. The connection the text makes between the great goddess Mahadevi and Kali slash Chamunda seems to support Thomas Coburn's theory of the crystallization of the goddess tradition, in which he argues that the Devi Mahatmya was the first systematized attempt to reconcile the various goddesses of South Asia into one large tradition by ordering various local, regional, non-Sanskritic, and Sanskrit goddesses into one comprehensive entity, Mahadevi or the great goddess. A crucial process for making sense of Coburn's thesis is the crystallization of the Shakta tradition as Sanskritization. Sanskritization theory was made popular by Indian sociologist M. N. Srinivas in a modern study on the caste of the Kurgs or Kurdugu, in which, which was in the uh, princely state of Mysore. Srinivas used the term to describe the adoption of Sanskrit Hinduism of higher caste by lower caste as a means of social mobility. He suggests that Sanskrit rituals spread to all levels of society through similar processes of adoption at various times throughout India, during which the non-Sanskritic tradition was gradually lost. Over time, usage of the theory of Sanskritization has broadened and is often used as shorthand for the process of evolution when local traditions in which uh, Sanskrit ritual practices were implemented and Sanskritized names were adopted for local deities. Fritz Stahl, one of the first scholars to critique Srinivas's implementation of the term, which he claimed was riddled with inconsistencies and unknowable assumptions about gains and losses of traditions. He suggested the process was not a one-way emulation or imitation of another tradition. 
Instead, he suggests that at all times, uh, at all points in time, ranging from the Vedic to the modern, the relationship was always dialectic in which Sanskrit traditions influenced regional cultures and regional cultures influenced Sanskritic traditions. Perhaps as a result of these critique, the term Brahmanization became more fashionable, describing these processes. Instead of theorizing that lower castes mimic the elite Sanskrit world of ritual culture, Brahmanization points to the agency of Brahmins in proselytizing a ritual and mythic worldview that slowly integrated itself into most levels of Hindu practice. Both terms, Sanskritization and Brahmanization, and the processes that they theorize can be seen in portions of the history of Mysore and its surrounding deity, and its surrounding deities, Chamunda, uh, Utnali, and Nanjunda Swami. In the religious and devotional proliferation of the 19th century court of Krishnaraja Woodier III, Sanskrit increasingly replaced Kannada in local temple inscriptions, and the names of local deities were altered to include Sanskrit honorifics uh, and to reference pan-Indic myth. Chamundi and Nanjunda Swamis names were supplemented with the feminine and masculine forms of the San Sanskrit term Ishvara, and they, and they became known in official documentation as Chamundeshwari and Nanjundeshwara. The Sanskrit suffix is frequently used in the songs of Vaitara Chamundi. Utnali's, Utnali's local identity was also masked through her uh, name change, and official records and inscriptions began to refer to her as Dwalamuki, or the tongue-flamed one, a famed manifestation of the goddess uh, who was formed from the tongue of the goddess Sati after her self-immolation in Dukcha's ritual fire. Additionally, between 1819 and 1848, the local Shivarchika priests of the Chamundi Temple on Chamundi Hill were replaced by Tamil Brahmins who were invited by the same king, Krishna Raja Wadiya III, who introduced the ritual programs of the Shaivagamas ritual handbooks. So in the case of Mysore's local tradition, there is evidence of processes similar to Sanskritization and Brahmanization taking place. However, this is only part of the story, and neither can make sense of the totality of the developments within the local tradition. While incorporating these changes, local practices continued alongside and together with the newly introduced names, priests, and rituals. The complex relationship between elite Sanskritic Brahminic traditions and those that did not align with their practices and the tension over the identity of the goddesses is not a recent phenomenon. Indeed, goddesses like Chamundi and Chamunda, as she is more often referred to in Sanskritic sources, have always been, <coughs> excuse me, has always been complicated insider-outside relationship with elite traditions. Though the goddess Chamunda was introduced into Sanskrit traditions in the Devi Mahatmyam, in the Malati Madhva by Bhavabhuti, Chamundi devotion is shown to be at odds with and threatening to the agamic ritual culture of the court. In the text, the devotees of Chamunda, referred to as Kapalikas, uh, who are depicted as practicing their rituals in cremation grounds and abducting young virgins in order to sacrifice them to the goddess. As the story goes, a female Kapalika named uh, Kapalika Kundala, uh, who has the ability to fly through the air because of her perfection or siddha of yoga, discovers Malati, the daughter of a, of a minister who, is, who has smitten the hero Madhwa, the son of the king, with her beauty and modesty. For these same reasons, she was the perfect spe specimen for their Guru Diksha sacrifice required by the Kapalika's teacher. In this case, the sacrifice of a virgin to the goddess Chamunda, according to the story. When Act 5, Scene 2 begins, the Kapalikas have captured Malati and have taken her to Chamunda's temple for sacrifice. They begin their ritual by enchanting the name of the fierce goddess by saying, Devi Chamunde Namaste Namaste. The hymn continues, <clears throat> O goddess, your prideful, destructive rumbling, confusion-producing dance, which has manifested power of the entourage of Shiva that causes the egg of Brahma to be destroyed, because it presses down the earth ball and submerges the shaking tortoise shell, causing the churning seven seas to be thrown into your gaping mouth that rivals hell. This hymn goes on to describe the ornaments worn by the goddess that include an elephant hide robe, necklace of skulls, and crescent moon in her hair. Written from the perspective of the medieval court, Bhavabhuti associates devotion to Chamunda with the non-Brahminic practices of human sacrifice, clearly demonstrating a distrust of the goddess's devotees. 
The text also praises Chamunda's ability to provide magical powers, but shows that these powers are harnessed by her devotees for evil and disreputable worldly achievement, not for the higher goals such as moksha or kshatriya dharma. Perhaps these rituals were allusions to local fierce goddess practices, like those of the goddess Ai described in the 5th century Tamil, <coughs> Tamil text, or even human sacrifices that supposedly took place on Chamundi Hill prior to the 19th century. While Adiv Mahatmyam and Malati Madhwa are very different in their perspectives on fierce goddesses, uh, they are united in their depiction of goddesses who were terrifying and craved blood and human sacrifice. The Devi Bhagavata Purana, however, constructed a different image of the goddess, uh, even within the same narratives. C. Mackenzie Brown has examined the theological shifts of the Shakta tradition from the Devi Mahatmyam and Devi Bhagavata Purana. He shows how the Devi Bhagavata Purana emerged from a context of sectarian and communal chaos as a reaffirmation of Shakta theological stands in the Devi Mahatmyam and in response to the Vaishnava Bhagavata Purana. He suggests that the composers of the Devi Bhagavata Purana had two theological goals. First, to demonstrate the superiority of Devi to all other deities, especially Vishnu, and second, to articulate the new ways the manifold nature of the goddess and her supernatural powers as they are manifested in the historical process. This new articulation with the Devi Bhagavata Purana, Brown suggests, was a shift from the militant goddess of the Devi Mahatmyam to the focus of the goddess as mother and materiality. To accomplish the transition to mother, the composer sought to sanitize the older martial and erotic myths of the goddess, especially those contained within the Devi Mahatmyam, replacing them with new versions of the goddess as a mother of infinite compassion. As part of the reworking of the goddess tradition in the Devi Bhagavata Purana, two new Devi Mahatmyams were created. These new Mahatmyams were modeled on the uh, Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavata Purana and focused only on the path to liberation, opposed to the dual path of spiritual and immediate earthly boons promised in the Devi Mahatmyam. The Devi Bhagavata Purana reinterpreted the goddess's previous nature that was somehow dark, malevolent, sinister, and only appeased uh, when only appeased becomes benevolent, to stress greater degree of supreme compassion nature of the goddess. The stories of the goddesses that were previously so raw, visceral, and powerful were transformed into transcendent metaphysical lore, and fierce goddesses such as Chamunda were pushed further to the periphery of mainstream, elite, refined religious culture. <clears throat> Therefore, even within the elite Sanskritic tradition, the goddess and goddesses are not stagnant characters, but they inhibit a range of identities depending on perspective, rhetorical strategy, and time period. Indeed, indeed, as Kathleen Erndl and Lynn Falston have demonstrated several decades ago, the recent work and the recent work on the Himalayan goddess Hedimba by Halperin has thoroughly corroborated. Individual goddesses can occupy multiple positions on any spectrum of ferocity, docility, and or malevolent and benevolent. Through cycles in their ritual lives and through the perception of those observing them and manipulating their identities. Therefore, the theories that put the two traditions at odds, that is, elite versus folk or regional versus pan-Indian, does little to help us understand the form and function of the songs under discussion, much less how they serve as sites for the construction of local meaning. Instead of traditions at odds, comparing similar but ultimately different narratives as stories of on equal footing, we could see <clears throat> excuse me, we could see how the particular details reflect the context of the stories and agencies of those that tell them. For instance, in uh, Sisters Stand on My Tongue and Fight, two myths are seemingly merged into one epic battle, with both the shape-shifting shape buffalo demon and the producer of Bloodseed. The Kannada songs describe a more difficult battle that not only demonstrates the goddess's extreme power, but reflects the two-brother trope found in foundational narratives of local dynasties. Moreover, the protagonist in the Devi Mahatmya, <coughs> excuse me, and Bethita Chamundi both produce their helper goddesses from within themselves. Utnali comes to life from the waters produced by Chamundi's perspiration. It's certainly small, excuse me. <clears throat> it's certainly a small diversion, but it's meaningful as it relates to the wrath of the goddess on one hand and implications for water resources and life affirmation on the other. 
Additionally, in the Puranic tale, the protagonist goddess is extremely self-assured, laughing at the demon while she orders Kali to drink his blood. In the Kannada episode, Chamundi is scared and overwhelmed as she looks around for help with tears welling in her eyes. And it is Utnale who grabs her by the hand, tells her not to fear, and offers to drink the demon's blood. There's so much that can be said about these shifts in the narrative. Again, about water rights, social expectations of women and potential wives, and the wrath of the goddess. But for now, suffice it to say that a local tradition creates its novel, novel tradition that runs parallel and not contrary to pan-Indian myth, presenting a history of the goddess for the area that happened in the not-so-distant myth not so distant mythic cycle of time. As a local myth, the narrative produces a history of the temple and its foundation that is rooted in the deeds and actions of the deities, grounding local landscape within the field of cosmic significance. The city and her temple of Chamundi Hill um, are given primacy within the song because the deity chose to stay there after the battle because of the devotion of the local Whittier kings. The narrative also provides a background to explain the relationship between the goddess at the top of the hill, that's Chamundi, and the goddess at its base, Utnhali, building a devotional, ritual, and spatial relationship between the two that is subsequently extended to include Nanjunda Swami in later songs. Additionally, it places these locally important deities within the broader scheme of sacred geography by connecting the deities to sacred waterways such as the confluence of the Kapani and Kaveri rivers. The songs reference the goddess's journey down, uh, down to the city during Dasara, and it also describes the establishment of Utnali's ritual worship, which is promised by the goddess Chamundi. In doing so, these songs and the overall ballad describe the foundation of these temples and provide narrative justification for the expensive festivals and promises deities will remain local uh, if the rituals are continued. The entire devotional landscape and ritual calendar are simultaneously placed within significant space and time, while the deities are extremely imminent, with the gods and goddesses traveling the same roads, climbing the same hills, and bathing in the same rivers as their devotees. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simons. It was uh, extremely fascinating, and uh, thank you for taking us along the contours of the uh, Chamudi Beta song. Uh, maybe we can begin by uh, having you relate to all of us what, what actually prompted your interest in uh, this field and how you led uh, yourself towards working around these areas. And then if any of our audience uh, has any questions, then they can make a mention in the chat box and you can unmute yourself when your name is called out and ask your question. Yeah, so um, uh, my interest in this actually came, um, a, a several things came together at one point. I was living in, in Mysore um, in Kuvimpu Nagara, and I was taking Kannada lessons. And one thing that I was wanting to translate but haven't had a chance to at this point was uh, a book by P.K. Uh, Rajasekara called Betara Chamundi. As, but I didn't quite have the abilities yet to be able to, to read the book. Uh, simultaneously, there was a play being put on uh, called uh, Chama Chelove. And I went and saw that. And even though my Canada, especially at that point, was still progressing, um, the story was something very different than anything I'd heard about uh, Chamundi or Chamundeshri at that point. And then as it turns out, the book that I had wanted to read when I eventually read it was another version of the same story, um, which then led me to seek out the people who did it, which um, you know, are a group of the, the Kamsales, uh, who are performers, um, acrobats. You see them a lot during the Dasara procession. And so it's a song within their oral tradition. Uh, and what my main interest was that it, it brought together everything, every part of my academic identity, because uh, I studied the Woodiers. Uh, I had previously studied the Sanskrit tradition of Mahishasana Mardini. And then right here within this folk song, I had these two worlds seemingly colliding, but really actually running parallel and creating a, a new tradition, or at least encapsulating a new tradition uh, right there. So it was it was something that immediately sparked my interest. And, it, and by sparking my interest, it made me want to dive deeper into it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I also wanted to uh, ask you maybe by way of inaugurating some set of questions. Uh, in general, when we look at uh, oral 
folk tales or narratives of this kind, uh, there are a lot of intertextual references that do come up. And you did give an idea about the pan-Indian myths that seem to have some sort of crossover in terms of how we can engage with this particular uh, narrative. But are there also instances of, say, parables or puzzles that have to do specifically with the stala that is being uh, spoken about in this uh, song? Is there any reference of that kind? Um, so let me make sure I, I understand the question correctly. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm <coughs> having a hard time uh, talking. So uh, the, the question was about how um, these stories relate to the pan-Indian myths. Is no, that... uh, you did make a mention of the fact right. that they relate to pan-Indian myths. But within the story, are there also instances of puzzles or parables or fairy tales, which you generally see in other kinds of oral narratives as well? Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I understand it now. So, um, yeah, so as the story develops, it actually, and as the book develops, it transitions away from any sort of reference to pan Indian myth and becomes really, it's a, it's a, a romance. Uh, you could, it very closely resembles, you know, movies that you might see coming out of like Bangalore or, or uh, Mumbai, uh, or even Hollywood that is, is somewhat formulaic. And as the story goes, um, Nanjan Deshwara and Chaman Deshwara meet at this confluence of the rivers. They have a love marriage. Uh, and then what sparks a controversy is that they're from different caste. He's a Brahmin, she's low caste. Uh, he's has two wives. Uh, she doesn't want to move in with uh, co wives. So, uh, what emerges is this sort of very, um, I want to say common, but very relatable story about love marriage and the difference in the cast. So a lot of the story and what I argue in the rest of the book is that it seems to be addressing different social issues. Uh, and so it, it addresses uh, issues of, of caste and uh, diet. So, you know, whether or not you should be vegetarian, it brings in uh, Chanda Basava and stories. That's what makes all these allusions to what we might call legends in, in uh, the Kanadiga traditions. Uh, but it also has humorous details. So at certain portions, it's actually um, like Nanjan Deshwara has to sneak away to visit Chaman Deshwari. So he pretends that he has bed bugs and then puts down a log in his place. So his wives, when they come back, hug a log and, and think it's him. Uh, so there's there's this sort of comedic aspect of it also. Uh, but as far as actual, like sort of what you might call fairy tales, not so much as it's more stories that relate to a ritual world. So there's different rituals that are performed. Um, Chamundi becomes like a, a fortune teller who can raise people from the dead. Uh, but it's, and it kind of does it in a comedic way. Uh, but all of it is sort of aimed at making the audience think about social issues. Like why is it important that people are from the same cast? And of course the Kamsales are a low caste. So from their perspective, uh, I really think that it's sort of trying to motivate uh, social change by breaking down some of these barriers. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Norin Aziz has a question. Ma'am, you may unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, uh, perhaps she's unable uh, to... Yeah, yeah. Hi. You're there. Yes, hi. Uh, yeah. I was not able to unmute. Uh, no, my question was that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Caleb was uh, mentioning that the female uh, principal was at one level a goddess, and then at another level she's also, you know, through the story of Malati, the first one, you know, when occasion demands to be sacrificed. Uh, how do you explain that? At one level, you know, uh, someone being revered to such an extent, and then also the one to be sacrificed. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it does show that, you know, these different traditions have been at odds at different times. <laughs> Excuse me. Because in the, the Malati Madhwa story, it is, you could easily read it as an, an anti-goddess text. Uh, because the, the people who are worshipping the goddess in the form of Chamunda, of course, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but they're worshipping this fierce goddess, um, and they view her as powerful, but also something to be feared. And so I think in the um, in Bhava Bhuti's text, it's actually, you could say that the feminine principle is something that is like to be feared and to be controlled. Therefore, the sacrifice would make sense. 
but then when within the Devi Mahatmyam, Devi Bhagavata Purana, even the Chamundi of the Hill story, the power of that um, of the the feminine principle of prakriti of shakti is it can be scary and it can do other things, but it also is something that is that ferocity of a mother and so it's something to be celebrated and something to be to take part in so i think it's two different world views uh between the the goddess tradition of you know uh david mahatmyam david Bhagavata david Bhagavat purana kalika purana uh, uh chamundi as viewing as a positive force and then the multi madhva text viewing it as a as a dangerous force that needs to be dealt with Okay, does anybody have any other question? All right, perhaps in the meantime, I could probably uh, ask another question. Uh, there are several popular cultural references to this particular narrative as well, in terms of <coughs> cinema, in terms of uh, songs that have actually been produced uh, technically, digitally. How do you see the proliferation of this myth in our contemporary context today? Uh, you're going to have to help me out here because I'm actually, I'm going to because I want to write these down. So when you're, you're speaking of this, are you talking about the local Kannada story or the broader Mahishasara Mardani story? Yeah, it very often overlaps between the two. Uh, so you see that there are several instances of uh, films that are located within the Mysore context and it also borrows from the Devi Mahatmya sort of, you know, uh, uh, line of thought as well. This uh, homogenization of some sort of the deity and it seems to in some ways come up in many of these uh, films as well so are you familiar with any of these popular cultural references and their I, currency in I'm my core or in current okay it, it, could you share some of the the, the titles with me or yeah i will i will put some of them up on the chat box as oh, well oh great you. thank you yeah. so much yeah, yeah. i um, and yeah, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to get a hold of um, much by way of popular culture from um, either sandalwood or, or local uh, songs without already knowing them, especially when I'm here in the U.S. So I would really appreciate any of those references. Does anybody have a question to ask at this point? Uh, yeah, Dr. Can Mayer. I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Calypso. It was a wonderful uh, uh, talk I really enjoyed because I work on cultural uh, geography and it was wonderful to hear this localized version of the goddesses. I've also been working on some goddess aspects, uh, but more from uh, women being deified, like mm. normal women being deified. But uh, my question is about uh, the body of the woman, the body of the goddess, right? Now, uh, I, I do find, you didn't mention it, but I would like to know that when we sanitize or when the sanitization of the goddess takes place, does the body lose its place? Because here it's the sweat and the grime and, you know, Ganesha myth gets so sanctified that it becomes chandan from sweat, right? So have you found changes and have you seen the words that are used for sweat and grime and blood and scratches? Do they change when, when the myths change in the local and in the Sanskritization. Yeah, um, that's a that's a fantastic question. I mean, you know, in Kannada versions, you know, I'm I'm not very familiar. I'm right now I'm reading a, another version of the Nanjandeshwara story, but Chamundeshwara is only sort of tangential to that. Uh, but in the Sanskrit tradition, I mean, it's it's very clear from you know we're talking centuries here between like Devi Mahatmya and Devi Bhagavata Purana. Uh, the adjectives used to describe her, uh, especially Kali or Kali from the Mahatmyam to Kalika Purana, um, change dramatically. Because if you, and even you see this in, in material culture and iconography, that Chamunda, if you look at Saptamatrikas, especially older ones, she's emaciated. She's the only like older, you know, hag goddess, is what she's always called. And then by the time you get to like Chamundeshwari, she, looks like a young like woman who looks like Durga uh, so you see this this change from you know something fierce something terrifying to something that has more we'll call it normative beauty ideals uh taking on more mothering uh in sort of like sweeter uh tones and so it's the body definitely changes and one thing that i think is might be really interesting uh for discussion i really like this question is 
thinking about how goddesses, as they become part of the um, as Brahmin priests, uh, how they're dressed differently, because Chamundi is always shown as a, a naked goddess. And then now, even in Chamundeshwari, uh, when you're in the temple getting darshan, she wears beautiful saris and all this. But <laughs> underneath, she's nude, uh, which you don't see because of, you know, you know I can't go in there during the, the Abhisheka. Uh, but from conversation with the priest that she she's a, a nude goddess. So even the idea that she has to be covered now uh, gets to something of this body, right? That it has to be controlled, sanitized. Um, and I think that's, yeah, it goes into a lot of different fields about sort of yeah. patriarchy and, and all of that that, um, you know, um, is very interesting, but um, extremely complex. Yeah. I'd love to hear your, about your research and, and what you're working on, because that's a great. Yeah. Sure. Let's keep in touch. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll write you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll write you. Does anybody else have a question? Yes, uh, Chinappa, you may unmute yourself and ask the question. So uh, I, I was wondering if uh, the coming together of Nanjundeshwara and Chamundeshwari uh, in the narrative also coincides with the emergence of stronger religious centers within uh, the dynamics of the Maiso principle itself, which might also mm -hmm. coincide with the coming of uh, um, new uh, Brahminical practices from, as you mentioned, Tamil Nadu. If you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that's a, another fantastic question. Um, so in, in previous research that I had done, I had sort of tracked the relationship of Nunjan Deshwara to the the kings of, of Mysore, the wood ears. And, you know, you actually find through all, all of their inscriptions, most of their text, um, they don't really mention Nanjan Deshwara much until the early 18th century when the Kalales, uh, Dalavais take over. And so you see the strong emergence of the uh, Nanjan Deshwara uh, narrative and identity in the temple all become really important within Mysore at that point. And so I, I you know, I hesitate to speculate because I don't have the evidence to prove it, but you know, it seems that that's the point in history to when um, Chamundeshwari and Nanjan Deshwara are probably joined, at least in the in the elite texts, because I, I don't have anything for the for the like local folk tradition uh, that could suggest it was earlier or later. But you know, it makes perfect sense um, whenever you're thinking about their their marriage and the emergence of uh, religious centers, especially if you think about the the period to when uh, Mumadi Krishnaraja is is reigning, because part of his patronage um, is actually to uh, the Nanjunda Swami temple. So he has his Bhakti Vigraha installed there along with the Nayanars. Uh, so it's, he's really making a program of, of connecting Nanjundeshwara. And I think this is probably actually reflective of something that's already going on. I don't think he's creating it, but I think there's a strong uh, pilgrimage and devotional network that connects um, Chamundi Hill and Nandandeshwara, especially as you would have walked before the roads, having to go to Utnali, take some rest, and then go up the hill, uh, because the backside of the hill takes a lot longer than the, the front side. Well, I guess, depending on perspective, the it would be the south side of the hill. Um, takes a lot longer because it's a, 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 a lot longer trek up there. So I think that it's, you know, the, the marriage is actually reflecting something that's going on as far as uh, pilgrimage networks. And it's explaining kind of how all of these sites work together. And of course, putting it kind of in a Shiva Shakta uh, framework. All right. Uh, any other questions? And I, I hope that answers the question sufficiently. I, I realized that uh, Chinapa that I was just kind of, kind of rambling. But yeah, all these questions are are so wonderful. I, I hope everyone will will stay in touch because I have uh, lots of questions for you all too. Yes. Do we have anybody else who wants to either comment or ask something?
And I, I would like to take a moment um, to to ask to thank everyone for for joining, uh, and um, Anna for uh, the invitation. This has been a, a really delightful experience for me. It's a pleasure to also have hosted you. I think Arya has a question. Go on, Arya. Yes. Uh... Thank you, uh, Professor Caleb, for that interesting talk. So just um, you were talking about, um, let's say, uh, uh, Lingayats and uh, uh, connecting them with, uh, uh, let's say, Brahmin community as such, right? So uh, I was, because uh, when we historically look at that particular aspect, it's also pointed out that uh, they sort of, sort of follow Basava tradition and, uh, let's say, um, and uh, largely is associated with lower caste so how do you look at that particular dynamics yeah it's it's a, a extremely complicated thing that i'm still you know doing a lot of thinking through because the um the consoles uh were you know however you want to phrase it but uh converts to the to the lingayat tradition um and so they associate themselves with the lingayat matas uh but within the broader scheme of you know, people's understanding of of caste and hierarchy uh, are typically seen, they are seen as low. Um, but, of course, there's that Brahmin identity within the Gaia tradition, even though it's, uh, you know, anti-caste, but, you know, that's that's for another uh, discussion. So the, the text is actually gets quite complicated about trying to, to sort of handle this dual identity of, like, someone being high caste Brahmin, low caste, um, you know, agricultural, and then how Lingayat philosophy actually makes both of those meaningless. So in some ways it reifies both of these, but it's sort of reflecting society, but then it brings in a lot of Lingayat philosophy through narrative to be able to explain that like, that while everyone assumes that these are important categories, they're absolutely not. And so actually in one uh, really interesting dream that uh, Chamundi has, she's, um, it, it goes sort of all over the place, but in one part of it, she actually sees a vision of Chanabasava and Chanabasava marries um, like a tribal girl. And then to consummate, not to consummate, but to, to consummate the ritual marriage, uh, actually Chanabasava uh, sacrifices a buffalo. And then the story goes on and it doesn't give any explanation of the dream. But I, for me, it's actually a quite telling thing that it's, you know, taking, you know, the proliferator of the Lingayat tradition after Basava uh, and then ma put, make, ha he marries a tribal girl, which of course is reflective of the assassination of the, of the king that led to the Lingayats leaving. So there's all these like intertextual references. Uh, but at the end of it, Chanabasva, who would have been extremely against religious, like ritual sacrifice and sacrifices a buffalo, which is kind of what Chamundi had done. So I, it takes all these categories and kind of builds them up to seemingly like purposely knock them all down and say they're actually um, not important at all. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Thank you for the question. All right. Anybody else? We may have time for a question or two. Well, if you think of any more, you're free to email me. I included my email in the chat. so. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm very happy to continue the conversation uh, later or, you know, on another um, format or whatever. All right. So uh, since uh, Dr. Simons has also shared his email contact with us in the chat, uh, I'm sure we can get in touch with him in case we have any other questions or we want to carry these conversations forward. On that note, let me thank Dr. Simons for having uh, joined us now. I think we can see some light in your background and it has yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for joining at uh, this hour back there. And uh, we wish you a very good day ahead. And we look forward to many more such conversations in the future. Thank you. And thank you for having me.